climate of every country in Western Europe is mild because of the Atlantic Ocean. This is partly due to strong currents in the Atlantic, which carry warm water from the Caribbean to Europe's coastlines. Also, prevailing westerly winds traveling over the Atlantic carry wet weather to regularly irrigate the land. The mild temperatures and moisture promote fertile growth. This in turn provides a variety of habitats for an astonishing range of species. We're on a journey during which we'll explore this wonderful wildlife. The journey began in the middle of the Atlantic, in the Azores. It will end in Iceland. It's a journey from the warm south to the colder north. Previously, we visited Portugal and Spain. We now head off to France, the Channel Islands, the southwest coastline of England, and Western Ireland. Eventually, we'll reach the mainland and islands of Scotland and the Faroe Islands. We're on an extraordinary journey of Atlantic-facing land and its wildlife. Some hundred kilometers south of Toulouse in the French Pyrenees, you'll find the Orlu National Park. It's a stunning upland area. The National Park is named after this summit, Mount Orlu, a vast slab of rock rising to the clouds. This part of the Pyrenees is warmed by the Mediterranean and gets rain from the Atlantic. During the winter, this rain falls as snow, so much snow that even in June it still lies on the highest slopes. It's a place where springs and summers rarely last more than two or three months. It's a difficult place for wildlife to survive. These are chamois goats. Being sure-footed and agile, they're perfectly adapted for life on steep rocky slopes. With the snow receding, they can browse on the very highest crags. As the spring and summer seasons are short on the Pyrenees summits, warm sunshine and soft ground are signals for rapid growth. Plants like trumpet gentian specialize in growing on high ground. Although they look delicate, they're hardy plants and can grow quickly to produce bright, colorful flowers which attract insects for pollination. On the lower slopes, cold-blooded reptiles are active. This lizard is using the sun's heat to warm up. It's shedding skin. It's become too big for its old one. Spring is a time for animals to get into peak condition. All this activity draws in birds of prey to the uplands. This is a young golden eagle looking for something to catch and eat. It's come to the right place. There are plenty of these around. They're marmots. They're a type of ground squirrel, and in fact are the largest squirrel species in the world. They're quite a fat little mammal, and there's a reason for this. As it's very cold in the Pyrenees from October to April, they hibernate for almost eight months a year. 
When they wake up in the summer, they eat just about anything they can find to build up the weight they've lost during hibernation. They just eat, eat, sunbathe, clean their fur, and have offspring. This is a youngster. It's sitting next to its mother lying flat on the rock, simply conserving all their energy. Occasionally, there's time for play. These three youngsters clearly have energy to spare. With predators around, marmots have to be able to defend themselves from attack. They do this by having lookouts. An adult who keeps an eye out for any potential threats. If there's danger, it will call. The rest of the troop will soon vanish below the surface. They won't disappear for long. They'll soon be back up again and feeding. On the lowlands, 50 kilometers south of Toulouse, you'll find the rural region of Ariège. Here, the land is fertile. There are rich pastures and crops. Most of them are growing in an old-fashioned way, without the use of poisonous pesticides. This allows wild plants and insects to thrive side by side with the crops. There's a constant natural sound. It's the sound of wildlife. This is a heath fritillary butterfly. It's rare in much of Europe, but not here. There's plenty of food for it on the untreated crop and the wild plants growing around the field. As there are so many insects on the crop, bee eaters live and breed here. They're probably Europe's most colorful birds. They eat large insects, mostly bees and beetles, and catch them as they fly. European bee eaters nest in southern Europe and spend the winter in tropical Africa. They're sociable birds who like being together. The best areas for wildlife in a crop field are along the edges. The thick vegetation is an excellent place to hide. This is a western whip snake waiting for a passing mouse, frog or lizard. It's watching with big open round pupils. It can move quickly, hence the name, whip snake. It's not venomous but simply uses stealth and speed to kill prey or to defend itself. It's a common snake that you'll find throughout southern France. The combination of Mediterranean heat, rain from the Atlantic, and land that's farmed in an old-fashioned way makes this field in Ariège a haven for wildlife. In effect, it's a snapshot of the natural landscape of lowland southern France of the past a reminder of what's been lost in many parts of Europe because of modern land use. Some 60 kilometers west of Bordeaux, on the coast facing Arcachon Bay, you'll find Europe's largest sand dune. In common with many sand dunes in Western Europe, Pila sand dune has been formed by strong Atlantic winds that deposit sand along the coastline. The sand dune began to form around 5,000 years ago, after the sea levels had risen after the last ice age. It moves inland 
by about seven meters each year. One important habitat, however, stands in its way, a wide boundary of pine trees. This is the Lond Forest, Europe's largest coastal pine forest. It's a man-made plantation for the production of wood. Although it's not a natural wild landscape, it's a perfect habitat for many species of mammals and birds. This is a roe deer, a female. They're common throughout Europe. They're usually very secretive. This one is grazing on one of the open grass lanes, but close enough to the cover of the forest if it senses danger. This is a hobby, a small migratory falcon. Hobbies spend the winter in Africa and fly north to Europe during the spring to nest. The Montague's Harrier, a much bigger bird of prey, does the same. This is a male, and he's carrying prey in his talons. He's been joined by the female after calling her from the nest. He's brought food for her and passes it to her as they fly. She'll take the food back to the nest to eat or to give to her chicks if they've hatched. The nest will be on the ground among young trees. The surrounding tall vegetation helps to conceal its location. Montague's harriers are found in many different types of habitat. But like many other species, they're dwindling in number. This female has been tagged so that information about her movements can be collected. They seem to like coastal forests, but will live on any open land where there's plenty of food and good safe areas for nesting. But there are few areas left in Western Europe where this is possible, which makes Lond Forest a special location. As you travel further north, up Europe's west coast, the climate gradually becomes wetter. The prevailing southwesterly winds from the Atlantic bring rain. And this frequent rainfall leads to the formation of marshes on low-lying land. In Brittany, there's an impressive marshland 80 kilometers west of Nantes. After the Camargue, Briere National Park is the largest marsh in France. Approaching 400 square kilometers in size, it's a big area of wetland. Thousands of birds feed and nest here. This is a black tern, a summer visitor from Africa. They're found throughout the world and like to be near big pools of water. A marsh harrier, as its name suggests, has also adapted to live on wetland. It likes nesting in tall reed beds. It flies elegantly as it looks for a vole, a small bird or a frog to eat. Mammals also live on the marsh, but two are alien species. Muskrats are native to North America. They were brought to Europe around 100 years ago for the production of fur. But many animals escape from the fur farms and quickly spread throughout Europe. A koipu is quite similar to the muskrat and out of the water looks like a huge rat. This too was introduced to Europe for its fur, but this rodent originally comes from South America. Alien species usually become pests outside their natural environment, 
And these two mammals can do a lot of damage to plants and water channels in European wetlands. And this can harm the native wildlife. Measures are in place to control and eradicate them in many parts of Europe, which is important. There are few marshlands like Briere left in Western Europe. Similar marshlands elsewhere have been drained for agriculture and building. This one survived because it was used for centuries for the production of peat for fuel and reeds for roof thatching. Thankfully, this piece of France's natural landscape has been conserved, but it needs continuing protection. Not far from Briere National Park in southern Brittany, there's another outstanding special wetland area at Gironde. These man-made pools are a unique site for wildlife, especially wetland birds. Sea salt has been produced in the Gironde region for more than a thousand years and is still being produced here today. The land is very close to the Atlantic coast and at high tide, seawater is allowed to flow into pools. The process of evaporation then begins and salt is produced. Because the water in the pools is shallow, this ensures that the sun always heats the clay bed. This creates the perfect habitat for small crustaceans and plankton, which is an excellent source of food for birds. Over 20,000 birds come here every year. These are pied avocets. They feed by moving the upward turning bill from side to side to locate crustaceans and worms in the water and sediment. It's a technique that's unique to avocets. Like many of the other bird species at Gironde, they've come here to breed. The salt pans cover an area of 2,000 hectares and the walls around the pools form a network of artificial islands. These are perfect nesting sites. These common terns are catching fish for their chicks. They're aggressive and noisy birds and will attack any intruder on their patch of land. When nesting is finished and their young are fledged, common terns will fly a very long way to the western coast of Africa to overwinter. Black-winged stilts also nest here, and they too are noisy. They constantly call to warn other birds away and to reassure their chicks. Black-winged stilts, common terns and avocets are three of nearly 200 bird species that live on the Giron salt marsh. For an artificial landscape, it's a remarkably rich habitat. Moving north to the Brittany coast near Roscoff, you'll discover the magnificent beach of Karema. It's a stunning landscape that extends along seven kilometers of Atlantic facing coast. A large flock of black-headed gulls have landed. They're a common gull that you'll also find further inland. They're looking for food. This one is using its feet to stir up the mud and provoke worms and small invertebrates to the surface. They're all at it. Amongst the black-headed gulls, there are a few Mediterranean gulls, which look similar, but have a much darker head. 
These gulls have only recently spread to Western Europe from the Eastern Mediterranean, but their number is gradually increasing. The wildlife on Karema Beach is not exceptional. These birds can be found in many parts of Europe. The special part of this coastline is above the beach behind the sand dunes. This is one of Europe's most important habitats for wild flowers. There are hundreds of different species. Pyramidal orchids with up to 50 tiny flowers. Beautiful marsh orchids. Also bee orchids with landing stages for insects that look like bees. And delicate marsh helleborines. Many different species of wild flowers are found here. These plants are in a protected area. They've been left to grow here for years with little interference from man, farm animals or pesticides. And they're thriving on big areas of the beach meadows. It's a time capsule showing the true nature of the Atlantic coast if left alone. The Atlantic Ocean affects the climate in northwestern Europe in two main ways. Westerly winds constantly bring moisture from the sea, producing a wet climate. A strong current also travels in the ocean from North America to Europe. It's known as the Gulf Stream because it originates in the Gulf of Mexico. The Gulf Stream carries warm water northwards up the east coast of America. It then crosses over to Europe near Newfoundland, forming a powerful North Atlantic current, which bathes the European coast with mild seas. A demonstration of its influence is found in the seas around the Channel Islands, off the coast of France. Between the two main islands, Guernsey and Jersey, you'll find Sark. Like the other Channel Islands, Sark is affected by a huge tidal flow, and the sea level here can drop up to 12 meters between high and low tides. As the sea rises or falls, the current can be incredibly strong and fast. This combination of strong currents and warm water from the Gulf Stream ensures that there's plenty of food material in the sea around the Channel Islands. Especially for filter feeders. These are jewel anemones. The water conditions are ideal for these beautiful animals. The water is packed with morsels of food and plankton which the anemones gather with their tentacles. These are sea fans. They look like a coral you'd expect to see in more tropical waters, but they're found here much further north because of the influence of the Gulf Stream. The most colorful fish you'll see around the Channel Islands and the seas next to France and Britain is the cuckoo wrasse. It's a territorial fish, and the male guards his patch of ocean attentively. He'll often have as many as six or more female fish within his territory, and keeps other males away. Cuckoo wrasse also have an extraordinary ability to change sex. This is a female, and she can become a male if the need arises. If something happens to a male, an old female will take his place. She will change sex and color, and then she, or rather he, will defend the territory. Because of their isolation, most islands develop some wildlife speciality. Jersey's curiosity lives on St. Bernard Beach. 
It hides amongst the thick growth of gorse and grass. It's a green lizard. The male is stunning and has a light blue neck and a bright green body. The female is just as impressive, with cream stripes along her body. The green lizard is one of Europe's largest lizards and can grow up to 40 centimeters in length. After the ice melted at the end of the last ice age and before the sea levels rose, Jersey was the last channel island to be isolated by the sea. That's why the green lizard is found only here and mainland Europe and not on any other channel island or on the British Isles or Ireland. It didn't have enough time to colonize further west before the rising Atlantic flooded. Another island speciality is found on the island of Alderney and it's active at night. It's a blonde hedgehog Hedgehogs on mainland Europe are usually brown, but the Alderney population have a genetic makeup that gives them a blonde color. Hedgehogs became extinct on the island around the time of World War I. They were an important source of food at the time, and too many were taken. They were reintroduced around 50 years ago, and by chance, a large proportion of the released hedgehogs carried a white color in their genes. As a result, most of the hedgehogs on Alderney are white. The Channel Islands in northern France mark a boundary where, further north, the Atlantic coast becomes much cooler and wetter. It also marks a point where some wildlife species start their distribution range. Gannets are only found in the North Atlantic Ocean. 3,000 pairs nest on Les Etac rock next to Alderney. Apart from one nesting location, a short distance south in France, all other gannet colonies are found further north, particularly on the British Isles. Across the English Channel, in Cornwall, on the southwest coast of Britain, you'll find another species that prefers the North Atlantic coast. Female grey seals have come to shore to give birth to their young. They always choose stony beaches, which are remote and where humans cannot reach. They also look for large beaches, where a dry area can be found, even when the tide is in. Here's a young calf, tucked in on one of those areas. After about five weeks, the mother leaves them, and the calves have to venture into the sea on their own. These older calves have lost their white fur that kept them warm on land and are now able to enter the sea. They'll learn to fish alone and most of them will survive. Once the females give birth, they're ready to mate again. Close to the shore, bulls are eagerly waiting for them. When the females return to the sea, the males immediately approach them and attempt to mate. Grey seals rarely live further south than Britain. They are true creatures of the North Atlantic and live on both sides of the ocean, both in North America and Northern Europe. Cornwall is the most southwesterly region of mainland Britain. It's a peninsula with dramatic, often inaccessible coastline. 
For centuries, the region was a mining area for tin, copper and arsenic. And old mine buildings are scattered along the coast. The cliffs, though perilous to people, are safe places for birds to roost and nest. This rock is a favoured place for these shags. They're a common coastal bird and can dive up to 45 metres to catch fish. The wildlife along the English coast is typical of temperate northern Europe. The land above the cliffs is damp, not too wet, and reasonably warm. There are plants like Bloody Crane's Bill, a common plant throughout Europe. Dropwort also grows on the slopes. It's the month of May, and the small pearl-bordered fritillary is flying. Also the small copper butterfly. Both are found throughout Europe. This whitethroat has just arrived from south of the Sahara to set up his territory on a patch of heath. He's declaring his spot with a scratchy song. It may not be a beautiful song, but it'll deter other males and attract a female to nest with him under the bush. Around 45 kilometers to the southwest of Cornwall, you'll find the Isles of Scilly. They're an archipelago of five large islands surrounded by islets and rocky outcrops. Because the islands are far offshore, they're important stopping places for migrating birds. They're a place to land, rest and feed before continuing on the next part of their journey. This is a blue throat. It's October and it's on its way south from mainland Europe or Scandinavia. He's heading for northern Africa in search of better winter weather. Quite often during the migration season, lost American birds land on the Isles of Scilly. Having taken a wrong turn on their migration flights from North to South America, they've crossed the Atlantic by mistake. This is one of them, a pectoral sandpiper. It's flown 5,000 kilometers across the ocean before reaching the first piece of land, and it's found St. Agnes Island in the Isles of Scilly. It'll be very hungry. In the center of St. Mary's Island, there's another lost bird. For obvious reasons, it's called a lesser yellow legs. It's extremely tired after its long journey. And here's another one, an upland sandpiper. Like the others, it nests in North America and usually migrates to South America during winter. This time it's been carried off course by the Atlantic winds. We don't know exactly what happens to these birds after taking the wrong route. Some experts believe they just stay and die in Europe. Recent evidence, however, suggests that some find a mate that's made the same journey from America, then settle in a suitable habitat on mainland Europe to nest and have chicks. There's also evidence that some birds travel to Africa and get carried back to America by easterly winds. Whatever they do, they hardly ever stay long on the Isles of Scilly. They know they haven't reached their correct or final destination. Ireland, the Emerald Isle. There's a good reason why it's bright and lush green. 
The prevailing westerly winds from the Atlantic guarantee moisture for rich plant growth pretty much all year round. One of the best woodlands in Ireland is at Glengariff, near the southwest coast. Glengariff wood is typical of old deciduous woodland found in northwestern Europe. It has predominantly oak trees, and the wet climate allows a wide range of ferns and mosses to grow. But amongst this growth, there are also rare and curious plants in this woodland. This is St. Patrick's cabbage. It's found only in the southwest of Ireland and western Portugal, and nowhere else in Europe. Why grow only in these two places? The same is true of another plant species growing nearby. This is kidney saxifrage, named for its kidney-shaped leaves. This plant is found only in southwestern Ireland, the Pyrenees, and the Cantabrian mountains in Spain. Nobody knows for sure why two plants can live only in two areas of Europe, and which are so widely separated. Perhaps early settlers brought the plants with them from mainland Europe. They certainly weren't here 10,000 years ago. Virtually every plant and animal, including this wood mouse, living on the woodland's floor, made its way to Ireland after the last ice age. How and at what point different species colonized Ireland largely remains a mystery. Some were brought here by people. Some may have made their own way soon after the Ice Age, when land bridges may have existed between Britain and Ireland. Some were carried by the wind, or may have drifted here on the sea. We'll probably never know. But once isolated and established on an island, plants and animals often develop into forms that are special to a location. like these red deer in Killarney National Park. They are the only true native red deer in Ireland. And they've been here since the end of the last ice age. Although red deer are widespread throughout Europe, and there are other breeds of introduced red deer elsewhere in Ireland, these are special. They're pure native stock, and they very nearly became extinct here around 30 years ago. These are mothers with their young. The young deer are lying down and have a mottled coat. When they're hiding in dense undergrowth, they're impossible to spot. The adults seek added security by staying close to the edge of the trees. At the first sign of danger, they'll retreat into the forest. West of County Kerry, and the picturesque bay of Balin Skelligs, you'll find the Skelligs. It would be difficult to find two islands so close to each other, and yet so unlike anywhere else in the world. Little Skellig, white and inhabited by birds. The island of Skellig Michael, green and inhabited by man for centuries. Monks began to colonize the island around 1,400 years ago. Though the monks have long left, their monastery has survived. It was perfect isolation for a harsh and committed life. It's isolation too that the birds are seeking on Little Skellig. 30,000 pairs of gannets cover the entire island. It's one of the biggest gannet colonies in Europe. The bird's droppings give the island its white color. It's an ideal nesting location. No predators live on this rock, and the cliffs are too dangerous even for adventurous human beings. Any young bird will be safe from virtually all land invaders.
It's also convenient for catching fish. Food is only a dip away from the island. If the rock above the water isn't enough of a wonder, the 70 meters of rock that lies beneath the surface is also teeming with wildlife. There are forests of kelp, just as rich as any tropical forest. There are thousands of anemones with many different colors. The majority are dahlia anemones. They'll eat just about anything that gets caught in the tentacles, including small fish and crabs. These are jewel anemones, similar to the ones we saw in the Channel Islands. Colonies of thousands of small animals cohabiting and creating a colorful landscape. Like dahlia anemones, they're common along North Atlantic coasts, but their number here is unusually high. There are also sea urchins, numerous starfish too. It's a very rich sea life. The sea is fertile partly because of the excrement of thousands of gannets that's continuously falling into the water. It supplies plenty of food material for the animals living here. It's here also that the colder sea of the northern part of the Atlantic meets the warm Gulf Stream. When warm seas and strong currents combine, they provide an abundance of food for marine life. On Ireland's Atlantic-facing coast, there's a constant battle between the sea and the land. This struggle has led to the formation of spectacular landscapes. The powerful waves eat away at the rocks to create perilous cliff faces. One of the most impressive in Ireland are the Cliffs of Moher in County Clare. Here, the coast has been eroded away to create a series of majestic cliffs, which rise to over 200 meters above sea level. Because the rock is relatively soft, the relentless action of the sea and the weather results in the formation of craggy rocks and cliff shelves, perfect nesting sites for seabirds. There are thousands of them here, going out to sea to catch fish and returning to their nests. These are fulmars, and these guillemots. It looks a precarious place to nest and lay eggs, but these birds all lay irregularly shaped eggs that don't easily roll off the narrow shelves. Above the cliffs on the thin grassland that lies on the rocks, there are chuffs, a red-beaked and red-legged crow. It's a bird that likes well-cropped grass pasture where it can easily probe its beak into the soft soil to find insect larvae. Though usually mountain specialists in the rest of Europe, in the British Isles and Ireland, they've adapted to live along western coasts. Ireland may not have a vast range of species or a varied wildlife, but what it does have is a few natural wonders, some of which are unique in Europe. This is the Borren in County Clare, a vast expanse of limestone rock covering 250 square kilometers. Long crevices break up the limestone, and in these gaps, plants grow. 
with strong winds constantly sweeping in from the sea. This is the only place where plant life can survive. It's also the only place where sufficient soil is found. Although it's a bleak location, 75% of Ireland's native plant species can be found here. Around 700 different species have been identified. What makes the Burren special is the coexistence of plants that normally live in very different climates. Take this flower, the White Dryas Mountain Avon. It's an upland plant commonly found on the Alps and in the Arctic. Growing next to it are orchids that are equally happy in more southern parts of Europe. It's as if nature is signaling that Ireland is the border between the far north and the more southern warmer parts of Europe. It's also a place where the effects of the last ice age are visible on the landscape. These little islands in Clue Bay, County Mayo, are gravel and rock deposits left by glaciers as they thawed and flowed into the sea. According to local folklore, there are 365 islands, one for every day of the year. All along the Irish coast, there are many more islands. And because of their isolation, a few have become havens for wildlife. Inish Boffin, in County Donegal, is a sanctuary for a secretive but noisy bird. It's a corncrake, a male calling in his territory, a patch of rough ground covered with weeds and nettles. The land may look untidy, but this is exactly what he needs, a place to hide and nest. Only rarely do you see this bird. He'll keep himself well hidden. But even secretive birds have to occasionally show themselves during the breeding season. He's flown all the way from Africa to nest here. The female is somewhere in the undergrowth, sitting on eggs. Corncrakes aren't particularly rare birds. They can be found throughout Europe during the summer. But the type of wild grassland they need has disappeared in most countries. In the far west of Europe, Inishbofin is one of only a few locations where you'll hear this call. The islander's way of life on Inishbofin hasn't changed for decades, nor has the nature of the land. This suits many different species of birds, like lapwings and skylarks, that struggle to find suitable habitats elsewhere on the mainland. This is what makes these remote places that face the Atlantic so special. On the next part of the journey, we'll explore the west coast of Scotland. It's full of natural wonders. We'll also travel to the Faroe Islands. It's a dramatic landscape of mountains rising out of the sea. Even more stunning is Iceland. It has a turbulent character both on land and in the surrounding sea, and wonderful natural history. <laughs>